Thanks for coming along to this session. My name is Mike Taylor. I'm the Commercial Director of the British Heart Foundation. I'm actually going to be joined by two colleagues this afternoon. Uh, John Norton, uh, who sat in the front row, who's our Head of Workplace Wellbeing Operations, and Sarah Danes, who's also in the front row, which is uh, who's Head of Wellbeing, Safety and Resilience at the BHF. So, uh, one of the presenters this morning talked about starting a presentation with a number. So the number I'm going to share with you is 1961. Um, so picture the scene. Uh, 56, 57 years ago, you've had a heart attack, you've been given a painkiller, and in those days, nothing else, no aspirin, no operation, nothing. You probably won't survive, and if you do survive, you'll be bedbound for a month, and you'll be told to take it easy forever, but you probably won't get much of forever, because the chances are that you'll have another heart attack, um, and you won't survive that one. So wind the clock forward, 50-something years, 56 years, now if, your heart, if you have a heart attack, we do know what to do, uh, and thanks in huge part to BHF research, our researchers, believe it or not, discovered why heart attacks happen. People didn't know in those days what was the underlying cause of them and how to treat them. And now, whereas 7 out of 10 people back in 1961 wouldn't survive a heart attack, now 7 out of 10 people do, and they'll return home to their families. Um, and you have case studies like this lady here, uh, Heine Shah, who was making Rice crispy chocolates for her family when she had a heart attack. It was completely unexpected. She had no previous medical problems, no family history, and no symptoms. So, there's been a huge amount of progress in cardiovascular health over that period, and we've come a huge way, but it says on the screen we still have so much more to do. Every three minutes, someone, in somewhere, someone somewhere in the UK dies from heart and circulatory disease, and that could be during the time that it takes to tie your shoelaces or boil the kettle or just sit through an ad break. So our mission as a charity, and the nation's cardiovascular charity, is to beat heartbreak forever. And we want to do that from heart and circulatory diseases, and it's worth just reflecting on what those are on, the, on this pie chart here and on what we do. So there's th essentially three elements to what we do. The big red uh, element there is research into heart disease, but we also do a lot of research into circulatory, circulatory diseases uh, and into their risk factors, which is very relevant for the conversation we're going to be having today. So why do we do that? Well, every day in the UK, 420 people die from heart and circulatory diseases. That's 150,000 people a year. Uh, if you look at stroke, it's the fourth biggest killer in the UK. Uh, diabetes, there are now 4.6 million people affected by and living with diabetes in the UK. And vascular dementia now affects 150,000 people. And those are just the four sort of major conditions that we're talking about at the moment through our campaigning. But we actually fund research into well over 50 other conditions, including uh, blood pressure or hypertension, uh, arrhythmia, and a lot of uh, inherited heart conditions. And what, how do we spend our money across that? Well, as you can see on the screen, currently we're funding probably close on £600 million worth of research. Uh, we fund the majority, more than 55% of the heart and uh, circulatory disease research in the UK. And actually globally, as far as we're aware, we're the largest funders, largest non-commercial funder of research into these areas. So we're currently funding over £440 million into heart disease, over 800 projects. You can read the numbers on the screen, nearly 20 million into stroke, uh, nearly 40 million to diabetes, and then 6 million into vascular dementia, which is a growing area. Now, many of you will have probably seen our television or cinema advert, which has been running uh, recently. Uh, it's had a fantastic response. And the point about this advert was really to demonstrate how heart circulatory diseases are all connected. So you may have seen when you saw things like vascular dementia and diabetes up on the screen there, you might have been thinking, actually, I hadn't made that connection before, you know, the way all these things, things are connected. And actually, I think the presentation and the meeting, or this event, is very timely today, uh, because Matt Hancock, who's the Secretary of State for Health, some of you may have seen it was trailed on the news yesterday, is making a keynote speech about uh, the need for people to focus uh, on prevention uh, and, and, and a degree of personal responsibility, but also the responsibility of employers uh, to consider their 
health and well-being. And it is important to say that many cardiovascular conditions are inherited, but many others only develop over time. And the risk for these can vary depending on a wide number of factors, uh, which include steps we can take in understanding the causes and management of those conditions. The British Heart Foundation is committed to using research to help people understand how to manage these, these risk factors and reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And our Health at Work programme is a key part of that strategy. Um, so I'm delighted to introduce you now, John Norton, who's going to tell you more about that programme. Thank you. So I was quite interested in this morning's session where we talked about flourishing and thriving in the workplace and the Health at Work programme is looking to support all organisations produce workplaces that have healthier and happier more engaged workers. Um, it was interesting for me, I read Investors in People uh, and it made a statement in its last wellbeing report that if the biggest asset your organisation has is its people, the biggest asset they have is their health and wellbeing and I think um, it's endearing to see a lot of you coming here and um, looking to invest your time and your money um, looking after your uh, well-being of your workers. So the Health at Work programme, it's actually been uh, running for a number of years, over 12 years. It's an on-site service um, and it's been evolving as well over those years and we're looking to make it better and better working with different companies and organisations. National organisations, <coughs> multinational organisations, they've paid for our training days and they've really seen it as an investment rather than necessarily a cost. Um, and for me, there's the sense of, um, I was speaking to someone actually earlier uh, at our stand, and we were talking about how it's actually a journey. Um, and I was looking at two quotes, in fact, for um, this sense of a journey. Um, one from Tony Robbins saying, the only impossible journey is the one you never begin. <laughs> and another one which I quite like, Robert Louis Stevenson <laughs> advising us that if we that we don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you plant. And so what I'd like to go through um, in my time is just to show you the journey that we take uh, a number of our organisations on. And we know that behaviour change can be a gradual process. Um, individuals need checkpoints uh, and they need new encouragement and motivation along the way. Um, so we've looked at a way to facilitate and monitor the health and wellbeing growth of these employees. So the first one, if, if you haven't seen that in our stand, we've actually, one of the best ways to do this in terms of your journey is to know your personal health numbers or know your numbers. Um, and especially that which relates to high blood pressure uh, and high cholesterol. And they're in fact two of the highest risk factors for heart and circular disease. Um, and so our health checks look at things such as uh, blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose and BMI. Now, um, one of the things which we're quite excited about is we use our heart age calculator. And if you're not familiar with it, we have it on our stand, but it's something that's been produced in partnership with NHS Choices, Public Health England and University College London. Um, and the test helps people to understand the individual and accumulative factors which may be increasing their heart age. And ultimately, um, we are looking the, to prevent the risk of premature death or ill health. So many can take impactful action by addressing behavioural factors such as smoking, obesity, uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, physical inactivity and excessive alcohol and smoking consumption. And I think one of the things which um, for me, I recently joined the BHF about a year ago, but the damage occurring in people's bodies um, is not directly visible uh, and it's easy to ignore uh, what is happening inside the body. So helpfully what I'll show you is what we're doing at the BHF to um, find that out for those companies and help those organisations. So, one of the stats that is particularly uh, powerful and still quite shocking is that uh, there are 15 million people in the UK with high blood pressure. And of those 15 million, 7 million people have undiagnosed blood pressure, which is almost 50%. So, crudely, 50% in this room could have undiagnosed blood pressure. Public Health England, um, who we've worked has noticed that cardiovascular is, is responsible for one in four premature deaths. I'll say it again. So cardiovascular is responsible for one in four premature deaths. And the World Health Organization states that heart disease is the biggest killer globally. And that's not to scare you, that's to give you information that even I didn't know. And I think it's how we at the BHF are then helping, guiding, advising and supporting organizations. So, um, 
this next slide is um, where I'm going to practice what I preach. Um, so in the interest of that, I decided to take the health checks. Um, I also then presented them back to the Executive Board of Directors earlier in the year. So bravely, hopefully, my audience, I'm going to bravely share these with you. Um, so the first one is uh, actually, when I took it, and it was actually in June time, it labelled me as being overweight. And again, with our research at the BHF, if you are overweight, um, it can create a greater risk of serious health conditions. And so that was one health factor, one number that I was presented with. The next one in the health checks, again, you may have seen in our stand, is blood pressure testing. And yes, it's nothing new, but I go back to that stat we said earlier. There's over half of the population almost that don't realise they, um, they don't have high blood pressure, the 15 million. So I took my test results. This, actually, this machine here is approved by the British and Irish Hypertension Society. Um, the practitioners that carried it out and the ones that are on the stand, um, they've carried out similar tests for the NHS Primary Care Trust and as part of their over health is check. So my blood pressure uh, was 118. It was 118 over 80, um, which is good news for me, um, as blood pressure still remains, as I mentioned earlier. So keep hitting it home. It's one of the leading causes for heart attack. And then this one, which was cholesterol, and this is the one which was a bit of a surprise for me. Um, so high cholesterol, um, 6.5. High cholesterol is um, common in the adult population. Raised cholesterol increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. And I actually found out that um, you don't have to be huge to um, have high cholesterol. Actually, it's affectionately known as toffee. So it's thin outside, fat inside. Um, and so for me, I then put all those figures into the heart age calculator, which is now what we use. And it gave me a heart age of 46. Happy to share in this room. My, my real age is 44. So I have a slightly higher heart age. Um, and for those who can't see it, it does suggest that I can expect to live to about 85 without having a heart attack or stroke. But for me, even though I worked for the BHF, I was actually then from that session motivated to lower my heart age and to look at what the BHF does to then help support people and organisations. So um, one of the best places, a part of our programme, is we like to come in and share our research and share information. We do this in four ways. We have a, an eat well zone, be active, We've got changing habits and think well. So that's one of the best places where we engage with workplaces. We can come on site and share that information. So in the eat well zone, it's um, unsurprising it's healthy eating, but we actually look at how it affects your body and how it actually you can lower your blood pressure, um, blood sugar and cholesterol. And the experts that have help individuals to learn which food types can contribute towards better <coughs> heart health. <coughs> Be active zone. Again, we're fully familiar that workplaces are all shapes and sizes, and so we come in and advise how you can actually um, do physical activity in the workplace, and they recommend simple, effective ways to increase activity on a daily basis. And then the last two, again, um, smoking and alcohol is still prevalent, and it is still uh, a, a real risk, particularly in we found with um, organisations that have, they have a head office, but quite often they have almost fulfilment centres, and we've been approached by a, a lot of uh, organisations who recognise that it's not just a head office mentality, and they're looking to care for their staff from a, a wider perspective. And then, really interesting hearing the conversation this morning with the uh, initial chairman's talk. And for us, we realise that heart health and mental health are closely connected. In fact, severe mental health problems are known to be two or three <coughs> times more likely to suffer from cardiovascular disease. So I'll say that's that two or three times more likely to suffer from cardiovascular disease. And as you know, workplaces can be really stressful places. So we talk to those organisations about sort of bad coping mechanisms that are when stress happens and more new healthy coping mechanisms that can be used. So um, following on from that, as I said, it's all a journey. And so we have a number of the booklets here, which is in paper form and downloadable form, but again, our clinical team and our medical team have actually produced these in conjunction with ourselves, and so that you can better understand your health numbers and the information that can help you to reduce your risk of heart and circulatory disease. Um, so there's a sample and there's some in the bags, uh, and can all have a chat in terms of if you have any particular interest in those particular areas. Now the final thing 
um, I'm looking at, I focus somewhat on improving your own well-being. But at the BHF, we're really interested and passionate about how we help the well-being of other people we love uh, and are close to us. So we're actually looking to bring out a paid-for service uh, for our CPR training program and bringing that into workplaces. Um, and you may ask, why do we want to do this? Well, to refresh your memories, across the UK there are around 30,000 cardiac arrests outside of hospital every year. The survival rate is 1 in 10 if no treatment is given. So put really simply, thousands more mums, dads, grandparents, children, they really could be saved every year if more people had those life-saving skills. And if you think about the workplace where we spend so much time, so those, those skills that are taught, actually 80% of cardiac arrests take place at home. So what we're looking to do is to come into workplaces, provide support and guidance and training, and ultimately create what we want is a nation of lifesavers. So that's a really brief summary and again more than happy to talk to you during lunch break or at our stand. We've got a wealth of information and what we've realised is, having talked to a number of you earlier, you come in all shapes and sizes and so we don't have a very rigid template. It's a bit like a gym instructor, we perceive that we, you come to us and you tell us what your challenges are, uh, what your constraints are, and we really try to put together a programme that fits you and your organisation. Um, and again, these are some of the companies that have, we've been proud to support over a number of the years. Um, and we really enjoy working with companies and finding out how we can help create healthier and happier and more engaged workers. So. Um, our third speaker is Sarah Dange. She's our Head of Wellbeing, Safety and Resilience. And I thought it would be nice that she tells you what we've done in our own backyard at the BHF. So, over to Sarah. <coughs> Thank you, John. And uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, it's lovely to be here and it was lovely to be asked to come and share with you, actually, our, our story and our journey as well in terms of what we've done <coughs> for our own people within the organisation at the British Heart Foundation. Um, I'm, I'm going to share with you, it's a bit warts and all, so um, you know, I'm not going to stand here and profess to you that I think we've got it all sewn up perfectly. We haven't. You know, um, We're on our own journey. We're, we're a, a three-year journey now into that, um, and I think there's still a lot we can do. I continue to learn and continue to develop and come into events like today. I've already seen and taken in lots of new thoughts and ideas that I think we could take back and, and translate into our own internal wellbeing programme. Um, but I would just like to share with you some of the key highlights from our journey, so how it came about, what we've done very quick, quickly, take you through that, um, and importantly to share with you a little bit of our successes and, and perhaps where we want to go moving forward. So if I was to take you all in a little time capsule now and hop you back to 2015, sort of back end of 2014, early 2015. That's where our own internal organisation, Journey for Wellbeing, started. And just to perhaps give you a little bit of context, because um, Mike's very, um, very nicely and very well summed up in terms of what our external focus is, our values, our, um, our vision and our mission for the British Heart Foundation. But it's also perhaps a little bit easy to overlook the scale and size and complexity of us as an organisation. I think it's important just to share that with you so you can get a sense of what some of our challenges were. A few figures then. So we've got um, just over 720-ish peaks and changes, but sort of some, around some 720, 730 shops and stores across um, the whole of the UK. Um, we have just pushing up towards 4,000 paid employees now, so it's not a, a small um, employee cohort, big numbers. And we have um, around 20,000 active volunteers as well. Most of those are in our retail operations, but a big chunk also um, support us within our fundraising activities. So we roughly have about 18 million customer interactions and customers, and about 90,000 people a year take part in our organised events. So we're big on um, cycles, runs and tracks. So we're a fairly big organisational um, um, activity. And with that context, and with the backdrop of us being leading heart health charity as well, I think it'd be fair to expect that you, outwardly, would expect us to have our wellbeing programme sewn up. But if I did take you back to 2015, that wasn't the case then, really, and, and perhaps a little bit embarrassingly so. 
Um, but what was important was that we recognised that at the time, and um, we recognised it through a number of key avenues. Firstly, we um, at that time ran a, a new staff engagement survey, and one of the key indicators from that came back that uh, only 54% of our people felt that the BHF cared for them, and for us that just wasn't good enough. That figure needed to be higher. We'd also recently at that time set our new organisational strategy and one strand of that was about wanting to become a world class organisation. So that's world class in the sense of everything that we do, as much as retaining and um, attracting the best talent as well. And for that, we need that, we need that grounding, you know our people are our biggest asset um, and we need that if we are to truly be able to beat heartbreak forever. And thirdly, we had the Health at Work programme, which John has just introduced you to and talked through. And that's been really successful for many years and is evolving. And we've now got the fabulous Heart Health um, Aid Checker facility within that as well. But going back to 2015, it was still a great programme, still very well used by a lot of external organisations. And loads of really um, super resources that we weren't making the best use of internally to the BHF. And that again was a little bit embarrassing. So bringing all of those factors together, that really gave us the, um, the driver to, to change, to do something different. So we put together um, our programme, um, which is Live Well, Work Well, which was by the first slide that you saw. And that incidentally was a, a name for the programme that our people came up with. We used that as an opportunity to engage with our people and run it as a competition. And that was the winning entry, to call it that. Um, but the approach is, actually it's not high science, it's um, probably what you'd expect to see, it's formed around a set of pillars, strangely enough they're not too dissimilar to the pillars that the Health at Work programme advocates, because that was what we were then looking at um, using better and more of, so we've got the mental health, the eat well, the changing activities and the um, supporting you as well. But what we layered onto that was this underpinning and overarching element of leadership. Because recognising that, and it's not just senior leadership, but that is actually leadership at every level in the organisation. And we, um, fairly swiftly after setting that kind of foundation up, set about enlisting and, and getting on board some champions, which we've got and, and have been successfully working together for the last couple of years. Um, and they actually call themselves wellbeing leaders. And that doesn't define their rank and status in any way, that just simply defines what they are, and that is that they're leading the wellbeing agenda. So the programme itself um, around those pillars um, entails lots of the things you might expect to see. Um, we run lots <coughs> of um, fun and exciting activities, so we've done pedometer challenges, we've done Fruity Fridays, I see there's a lovely fruit stall out here, food swaps, walking one to one, so there's everything that some of you might have tried um, and, uh, and more. And they're all really great things and they're all a necessary element of any good wellbeing programme. But also, I think some of our learning and what I would share with you is that they're not, they're not the panacea to it. It's not everything. You know, it is, it's really important that you still consider things like leadership and making sure that you build and nurture this culture of trust, of listening. Because without that, all of those activities will just feel superficial, arguably. Um, I just wanted to call out three things on this slide that I think have been really important for us. The mental health ambassadors is key and that's an, an area that we've been working on for the last about 18 months now um, and we've been working with Rethink Mental Illness on that um, and our ambassadors are much like our wellbeing leaders so they are championing that way um, and we're providing them with accredited training in mental health first aid as well. Keep up with Kerry, you might have read that on the slide and think, well, what on earth is that all about? Well, actually, Kerry is one of our uh, executive directors. She's director for people and organisational development. And if ever you go on a walk in one-to-one -one with Kerry, you would know what we mean by keep up with Kerry. She's a fast-paced walker. So we just use that as an opportunity over the summer as, an, as a, a chance to run a nice engagement activity piece. And I think that demonstrates that leadership and drive on this is at all levels and again I think as a learning and I share with you now I think that's really important leadership through every level in the organisation. And the last one on there, uh, our Live Well Work Well survey has been fundamental to helping us shape what we put in our programme each year. That helps drive and that helps sustain the listening bit that is so important. So in, some, in terms of some of our pivotal moments I'd just like to call out three of them. Um, which again I think from learning, um, I hope you might take something away from. 
The first was how are you? Um, so what that refers to is an email again that Kerry um, sent out, it was back in February 2017 and we hinged this around Time to Talk today, uh, which I'm sure some of you will have heard of, is a, is a national mental health um, day. And um, we used that as a platform to get our conversation going around mental health. We hadn't done anything really proactively around mental health before that point and it was completely and utterly pivotal. That was an email that Kerry crafted herself, um, sent it out, it went as a personal email to every one of our paid uh, members of staff. And it was simply asking, how are you? you know, tell me about how you do it. And, and actually, you know, um, think about your mental health. Not mental ill health, this is about your mental health, what makes you feel good. And uh, the response that Kerry got to that was pretty overwhelming. We had um, 40 odd responses directly back to Kerry um, to that, which were 42 very personal accounts of those individuals, how are they doing. We didn't expect that to happen um, and I have to say that that was the real marker for opening our conversation and it's carried on ever since. And if I skip to the last of those bubbles, um, the personal stories, that really interrelates because that refers to the fact that we've had three extremely brave members of our workforce that have been comfortable enough to step forward and to share their personal stories. Uh, one, a lady called Jackie, who works in our retail operations, very recently sharing her story about coping with bereavement. Um, Phil, who's a regional manager, again in retail, has talked about his um, uh, battle, as he put it, in, in some way, and, and living with and, and coping with OCD. And Carl, a gentleman, uh, fundraising manager and our fundraising directorate, who um, was diagnosed with depression some years ago. Um, and I really like to think that it's uh, the way that our leaders at all levels have instilled that element of trust and confidence for those individuals to have been able to, to come forward. The passing the baton bit is um, a little bit more anecdotal, but I think um, when I see our wellbeing leaders, as happens with people in roles, they move on, they change roles, responsibilities, and they have to relinquish that wellbeing leader role. Instead of us trying to find their replacement, usually what happens is they find their replacement for us now, and I think that, that says a lot about how engaged they are with the programme. A couple of last bits to share with you, some of our success factors, I believe these are key. Um, it's about engagement, it's about listening, and I really mean truly listening, active listening. Once you start getting to understand more about mental health, that is the key. You know, Don't just listen because you think you have to, but actually listen proactively to what that person is saying. Um, and I believe we do that on, on all levels in the organisation, and we act upon that. Involvement and be brave, you know, actually being brave is one of our core values and um, that sometimes means addressing the elephant in the room that has been sort of ignored for some time or lifting the lid on stuff that you know is perhaps going to be a little bit difficult to unpick and some of those elephants and some of those horrible bins full of lurky horrible things, it might be fact stuff, it might be perception, it might be fiction, doesn't matter what it is, actually if it matters to people it should matter to you in, in your programme. Um, so do be brave and, and do head some of those things front on. Um, in terms of our outcomes, we've had three key um, successes that I'd like to share with you. Our staff turnover, so this is during the time of, of us running this programme, our staff turnover has dropped by 12%. Now I'm not suggesting that the wellbeing programme has, has um, been the sole reason for that. There are other factors that, that we should give credit to within the organisation that's helped that, but I do think the wellbeing programme has been a, contrib a significant contributing factor to that. Um, our um, staff satisfaction in, work, in terms of work-life balance has increased, which is a really good um, metric to measure. And pivotal also to the mental health, and we asked this for the first time in, in our most recent Live Well, Work Well survey, would our people feel comfortable in disclosing a mental health condition or issue to their manager? And 67% who responded to that said they would. That absolutely blew us away. We didn't expect that in terms of being so positive. Just to wrap up then, a couple of last things to share with you. Um, earlier in the year, we were invited to um, become a case study as part of the CIPD's, um, they do an annual study and um, write a report about health and well-being at work. This 
report previously used to be titles so like managing attendance, managing absence, so it was very much more focused on just attendance, but recognising that this is much more of a holistic um, agenda, they broadened the theme of this report. And it was our absolute pleasure and privilege to be featured as the key, and in fact the only case study in that document. Um, and actually on the back of that we've been invited to do um, pieces and, and to talk and give our sort of story for two key um, HR publications as well. So there's HR magazine there you can see a snippet of, um, and the other one on, on the right there is from People Management magazine. An absolute privilege to have been able to do that. And what's lovely is that we're getting organisations coming to us to, to just take a little bit more from our journey as well. Not just charities. I, I was on the phone last week to a big pharmaceutical company that are looking at their wellbeing programme. And it's lovely to be able to think that we can share and hopefully help guide people on their journeys. So just to finish off, um, thank you for allowing um, me personally to share some of our um, story with you and our journey. It, it's not a done story, we've still got lots more um, to do. Um, but I think just on behalf of Mike and um, John and myself, just to say we're here, we'd, we'd love to have a chat with you. I think we might have some time for yeah. questions, just looking to John, so we'll, we'll open that up in a second. Um, but there's all of our colleagues at the stand as well, so please do it'd be lovely to chat with you, come and have a chat with us. And our, and our sort of proposition is really that we want to be with you and to help you on your journey. Thank you.